You worked at Twitter for a bit. I did. As an intern. Mm -hmm. The world's greatest intern. Yeah. All right. There's been better. <laughs> There's been better. Uh, tell me about your time at Twitter. How did it come about? And what did you, did you learn from the experience? So I deleted my first Twitter in 2010. I had over 100,000 followers back when that actually meant something. And I just saw, you know, my coworker summarized it well. He's like, whenever I see someone's Twitter page, I either think the same of them or less of them. I never think more of them. Yeah. Right? Like, like you know, I don't, I don't want to mention any names, but like some people who like, you know, maybe you would like read their books and you would respect them. You see them on Twitter and you're like, okay, dude. <laughs> yeah. But there are some people with same. You know who I respect a lot are people that just post really good technical stuff. Yeah. And I guess... I don't know. I think I respect them more for it because you, you realize, oh, this wasn't, uh, there's like so much depth to, the, to this person, to their technical understanding of so many different topics. The, okay. So I try to follow people. That, I try to consume stuff that's technical machine learning content. There's probably a few of those people. And the problem is inherently what the algorithm rewards, right? And people think about these algorithms. People think that they are uh, terrible, awful things. And, you know, I love that Elon open sourced it. Um, because, I mean, what it does is actually pretty obvious. It just predicts what you are likely to retweet and like mm -hmm. and linger on. That's what all these algorithms do. That's what TikTok does. That's what all these recommendation engines do. And it turns out that the thing that you are most likely to interact with is outrage. And that's a quirk of the human condition. I mean, and there's different flavors of outrage. It doesn't have to be, it could be mockery. You could be outraged. The topic of outrage could be different. It could be an idea. It could be a person. It could be, and maybe there's a better word than outrage. It could be drama. Sure. All drama. this kind of stuff. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like when you consume it, it's a constructive thing for the individuals that consume it in yeah. the long term. Yeah. So my time there, I absolutely couldn't believe, you know, I got crazy amount of hate uh, you know, just on Twitter for working at Twitter. It seemed like people associated with this, I think maybe uh, you were exposed to some of this. So connection to Elon or is it working at Twitter? Twitter and Elon, like the whole... There's just a, Elon's gotten a bit spicy during that time. A bit political, a bit... Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I remember one of my tweets, it was never go full Republican and Elon liked it. <laughs> you know, I think, I think, <laughs> you know... Uh, <laughs> Oh boy. I, uh, yeah, I mean there's a roller coaster of that, but the being political on Twitter. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. And also being just attacking anybody on Twitter, it comes back at you harder. And if it's political and attacks. Sure. Sure, absolutely. And then letting uh sort of deplatformed people back on even adds more fun to the to the to the beautiful chaos. I was hoping, and like I remember when Elon talked about buying Twitter like six months earlier, he was talking about like a principled uh, commitment to free speech. And I'm a big believer and fan of that. I would love to see an actual principled commitment to free speech. Um, of course, this isn't quite what happened. Um, instead of the oligarchy deciding what to ban, you had a monarchy deciding what to ban, right? Instead of, you know, all the Twitter files, shadow, and really, the oligarchy just decides what? Cloth masks are ineffective against COVID. That's a true statement. Every doctor in 2019 knew it, and now I'm banned on Twitter for saying it? Interesting. Oligarchy. Um, so now you have a monarchy, and, uh, you know, you, you, he bans uh, things he doesn't like. Uh, so, you know, it's just, it's just different. It's different power, and, like, you know, maybe I, uh, maybe I align more with him than with the oligarchy. But it's not free speech it's not absolutism. Free speech. But I, I feel like... Being a free speech absolutist on a social network requires you to also have tools for the individuals to control what they consume easier. Like, uh, not censor, you know, yeah, yeah. but just like control. Like, oh, I like to see more cats and less politics. <laughs> and this isn't even this isn't even remotely controversial. This is just saying you want to give paying customers for a product what they want. Yeah. Right. And not through the process of censorship, but through a process of like... Well, it's, indivi it's individualized, right? It's yeah, individualized, individual. transparent censorship, which is honestly what I want. What is an ad blocker? It's individualized, transparent censorship, right? Yeah, but 
censorship is a strong word that people are very sensitive to. I know, but you know, I, 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 I just use words to describe what they functionally are. And what is an ad blocker? It's just censorship. Well, when I look but at I you love right now, you're censoring. I'm looking at you. I'm censoring everything else out when I'm fo- when my mind is focused on you. That's you can use the word censorship that way. But usually, when people get very sensitive about the censorship thing, I I think when you have when anyone is allowed to say anything, you should probably have tools that m- maximize the quality of the experience for individuals. It's like, you know, for me, like what I really value, boy, it would be amazing to somehow figure out how to do that. I love disagreement and debate and people who disagree with each other disagree with me, especially in the space of ideas, but the high quality ones. So not derision, right? Maslow's hierarchy of argument. I think there's a real word for it. Probably. Yeah. There's just a way of talking that's like snarky and so on that somehow is gets people on Twitter and they get excited and so on. You have like ad hominem refuting the central point. I've like seen this as an actual pyramid something. Yeah, it's yeah. It, and it's it's like all of it, all the wrong stuff is attractive to people. I mean, we can just train a classifier to absolutely say what level of Maslow's hierarchy of argument are you at? Yeah. And if it's ad hominem, like, okay, cool. I turned on the no ad hominem filter. <sighs> I wonder if there's a social network that will allow you to have that kind of filter. Right. Yeah, so uh, here's a problem with that. Um, uh, it's not going to win in a free market. Yeah. It, what wins in a free market is all television today is reality television because it's engaging. Right? If, if engaging is what wins in a free market, right? So it becomes hard to keep these other more nuanced values. Well, okay. So that's the experience of being on Twitter, but then you got a chance to also... And together with uh, other engineers and with Elon sort of look, brainstorm when you step into a code base mm-hmm. that's been around for a long time. You know, there's other social networks, you know, Facebook, this is old code bases. And you step in and see, okay, how do we make with a fresh mind uh, progress on this code base? Like what, what, what did you learn about software engineering, about programming from just experiencing that? So my technical recommendation to Elon, and I said this on the Twitter spaces afterward, I said this, many times during my brief internship um, was that you need refactors before features. Um, This code base was, and look, I've worked at Google, I've worked at Facebook. Uh, Facebook has the best code, uh, then Google, then Twitter. Um, And you know what? You can know this because look at the machine learning frameworks, right? Facebook released PyTorch, Google released TensorFlow, and Twitter released... eh. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so you know it, it's a proxy, but yeah, yeah there the, the Google code base is quite interesting. There's a lot of really good software engineers there, but the code base is very large. The very code large. base was good in twenty in two thousand five. Right, it looks like two thousand five. Yeah, there's so many awesome. products, so many teams. Right, it's very difficult to. Um, I feel like Twitter does less, like obviously much less than Google, in terms of like the set of features, right. So like it's, I can imagine uh, the, the number of software engineers that could recreate Twitter is much smaller than to recreate Google. Yeah, I still believe, and the amount of hate I got for saying this, that 50 people could build and maintain Twitter uh, pretty w- What's the nature of the hate? Comfortably. That um, you don't know what you're talking about? You know what it is? And it's the same, this is my summary of like the hate I get on Hacker News. It's like, when I say I'm going to do something, they have to believe that it's impossible. Yeah. Because if doing things was possible, they'd have to do some soul searching and ask the question, why didn't they do anything? So when you say- And I do think say, that's where the hate comes from. When you say, well, there's a core truth to that, yeah. So when you say, I'm gonna solve self-driving, people go like, what are your credentials? What the hell are you talking about? What is, this is an extremely difficult problem. Of course, you're a noob that doesn't understand the problem deeply. Uh, I mean, that that was the same nature of hate that probably Elon got when he first talked about autonomous driving. Uh, but, you know, there, there's pros and cons to that, because, like, you know, there is experts in this world. No, but the, the mockers aren't experts. The, mock- the, 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 yeah. the people who are mocking are not experts with carefully reasoned arguments about why you need 8,000 people to run a bird app. They're, but the people are going to lose their jobs. Well, that, but also there's the software engineers that probably criticize, no, it's a lot more complicated than you realize, but maybe it doesn't need to be so complicated. You know, some people in the world like to create complexity. Some people in the world thrive under complexity, like lawyers, right? Lawyers want the world to be more complex because you need more lawyers, you need more legal hours, right? 
Um, I think that's another. If there's two great evils in the world, it's centralization and complexity. Yeah, and uh, it, the, the one of the sort of hidden uh, side effects of software engineering is uh, like finding pleasure in complexity. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't remember just taking all the software engineering courses and just doing programming and, and this is just coming up in this uh, uh, object-oriented programming kind of idea. You don't, like, not often do people tell you, like, do the simplest possible thing. Like, n like a, a professor, a teacher is not gonna get in front, like, this is the simplest way to do it. They'll say, like, this is the, like, there's the right way and the right way, at least for a long time, you know, especially I came up with like Java, right? Like is 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 there's so much boilerplate, so much like so many classes, so many like designs and architectures and so on, like planning for features far into the future mm -hmm. and planning poorly and all this kind of stuff. And then there's this like code base that follows you along and puts pressure on you and nobody knows what like Parts, different parts do, which slows everything down. There's a kind of bureaucracy that's instilled in the code as a result of that. But then you feel like, oh, well, I follow good software engineering practices. It's, a, it, it's an interesting trade off because then you look at like the ghetto ness of like Perl and the old, like how quickly you could just write a couple lines and just get stuff done. That trade off is interesting or bash or whatever, these kind of ghetto things you can do in Linux. One of my favorite things to look at today is how much do you trust your tests? Right, mm -hmm. we've put a ton of effort in comma, and I've put a ton of effort in tiny grad into making sure if you change the code and the tests pass, that you didn't break the code. Yeah. Now, this obviously is not always true, but the closer that is to true, the more you trust your tests, the more you're like, oh, I got a pull request and the tests pass, I feel okay to merge that. The faster you can make progress. So you're always programming with tests in mind, developing tests yeah. with with that in mind that if it passes, it should be good. And Twitter had a not that. So it what, was impossible to make progress in the code base. What other stuff can you say about the code base that made it difficult? Uh, like what are some interesting sort of quirks, broadly speaking, <sighs> from that com compared to just your experience with comma and everywhere else? The real thing that I, I spoke to a bunch of, uh, you know, like 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 individual contributors at Twitter, and I, I just I just asked, I'm like, okay, so like. What's wrong with this place? Why does this code look like this? And they explained to me what Twitter's promotion system was. The way that you got promoted to Twitter was you wrote a library that a lot of people used, mm. right? So some guy wrote an Nginx replacement for Twitter. Why does Twitter need an Nginx replacement? What was wrong with Nginx? Well, you see, you're not gonna get promoted if you use Nginx. But if you write a replacement and lots of people start using it as the Twitter front end for their product, then you're gonna get promoted, right? So interesting, because like from an individual perspective, how do you incentivize, how do you create the kind of incentives that will lead to a, lead to a great code, code base? Yeah. What's, okay, what's the answer to that? So what I do at Comma and at, uh, and you know, at TinyCorp is you have to explain it to me. You have to explain to me what this code does, right? And if I can sit there and come up with a simpler way to do it, you have to rewrite it. You have to agree with me about the simpler way. I'm, you know, obviously we can have a conversation about this. It's not a, it's not dictatorial. But if you're like, wow, wait, that actually is way simpler. Like, like the simplicity is important, mm -hmm. right? But that requires people that overlook the code at the at the highest levels to be like. Okay. It requires well, technical leadership you trust. Yeah, tec technical leadership. So managers or whatever should have to have technical savvy, deep technical savvy. Managers should be better programmers than the people who they manage. Yeah. And that's not always obvious, to trivial to create, especially at large companies. Managers get soft. And like, you know, and this is just, I've instilled this culture at Kama, and Kama has better programmers than me who work there. Mm. But, you know, again, I'm like the, you know, the old guy from Goodwill Hunting. It's like, look, man, you know, I might not be as good as you, but I can see the difference between me and you, right? And yeah. like, this is what you need. This is what you need at the top. Or you don't necessarily need the manager to be the absolute best. I shouldn't say that. But like, they need to be able to recognize skill. Yeah. And have good intuition. Intuition that's laden with wisdom from all the battles of trying to reduce complexity in code bases. Um, you know, I took, a, I took a political approach at Comma too that I think is pretty interesting. I think Elon takes the same political approach. Uh, you know, Google had no politics. And what ended up happening is the absolute worst kind of politics took over. Um, Kama has an extreme amount of politics, and they're all mine, and no dissidence is tolerated. So it's a dictatorship. Yep. 
It's an absolute dictatorship, right? Elon does the same thing. Now, the thing about my dictatorship is here are my values. Yeah, it's just transparent. It's transparent. It's a transparent dictatorship, right? And you can choose to opt in or, you know, you get free exit, right? That's the beauty of companies. If you don't like the dictatorship, you quit. So you mentioned rewrite before or refactor before features. Mm -hmm. If you were to refactor the Twitter code base, what, what would that look like? And maybe also comment on how difficult is it to refactor? The main thing I would do is first of all, identify the pieces and then put tests in between the pieces, mm. right? So there's all these different, Twitter has a microservice architecture, um, there's all these different microservices. And the thing that I was working on there, look, like, you know, uh, George didn't know any JavaScript. He asked how to fix search, blah, 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 blah. Look, man, like, the thing is, like, I just, you know, I'm upset that the way that, that this whole thing was portrayed, because it wasn't like, it wasn't like taken by people, like, honestly, it wasn't like by, it was taken by people who started out with a bad faith assumption. Yeah. And I mean, I, look, I can't like. And you as a programmer were just being transparent out there, actually having like fun. And like, this is what programming should you know, be about. It's just and like, I, I love that Elon gave me this opportunity. Yeah. Like really, it, it does. And like, you know, he came on my, my the, 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 the day I quit, he came on my Twitter spaces afterward and we had a conversation. Like, I just, I respect that so much. Yeah, and it's also inspiring to just engineers and programmers and just, yeah. it's cool. It should be fun. The people that were hating on it, it's like, oh, man. It was uh, fun. It was fun. It was stressful. But I felt like, you know, it was at like a cool like point in history. And like, I hope I was useful. I probably kind of wasn't, but like maybe I was. Well, you also out. were one of the people that kind of made a strong case to refactor. Yeah. And that that's a really interesting thing to raise. Like, maybe that is the right, you know. The timing of that is really interesting. If you look at just the development of autopilot, you know, going um, from mobile eye to just like more, if you look at the history of semi-autonomous driving in Tesla is is more and more like you could say refactoring or or starting from scratch, redeveloping from scratch. It's refactoring all the way down. And like, it, and the question is like, can you do that sooner? Uh, can you maintain product profitability and like, what's the what's the right time to do it? How do you do it? You know, on any one day, it's like, you don't want to pull off the band-aids. Like it's uh, like everything works. It's just like little fix here and there, but maybe starting from scratch. This is the main philosophy of Tiny Grad. You have never refactored enough. Your code can get smaller. Your code can get simpler. Your ideas can be more elegant. But would you consider, you know, say you were like running Twitter development teams, engineering teams, would you go as far as like different programming language? Just go that far? I mean, the first thing that I would do is build tests. The first thing I would do is get a CI to where people can trust to make changes. So Be that if before you keep I touched any code, I would actually say no one touches any code. The first thing we do is we test this code base. I mean, this is classic. This is how you approach a legacy code base. This is like what any how to approach a legacy code base book will tell you. So, and then you hope that there's modules that can live on for a while, and then you add new ones, maybe in a different language or Before like, we add new ones, we replace old ones. Yeah, yeah, meaning yeah. like replace old ones with something simpler. We we look at this, like this thing that's 100,000 lines and we're like, well, okay, maybe this did even make sense in 2010, but now we can replace this with an open source thing, right? Yeah. And, you know, we look at this here, here's another 50,000 lines. Well, actually, you know, we can replace this with 300 lines of Go. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I trust that the Go actually replaces this thing because all the tests still pass. So step one is testing. Yeah, and then we'll step do. two is like the programming language is an afterthought, right? You know, let a whole lot of people compete, be like, okay, who wants to rewrite a module, whatever language you want to write it in, just the tests have to pass. And if you figure out how to make the test pass, but break the site, that's, we got to go back to step one. Step one is get tests that you trust in order to make changes in the code base. I wonder how hard it is too, because I'm, I'm with you on uh, on testing and everything. I have from tests to like asserts to everything, but code is just covered in this because uh, it should be very easy to make rapid changes and know that it's not gonna break everything. And that's the way to do it. But I, I wonder how difficult is it to um, integrate tests into a code base that doesn't have many of them. So I'll, I'll tell you what my plan was at Twitter. It's actually similar to something we use at Kama. So at Kama, we have this thing called process replay. Mm -hmm. And we have a bunch of routes that'll be run through. So Kama is a microservice architecture too. We have microservices, 
in the driving. Like we have one for the cameras, one for the sensor, one for the planner, uh, one for the model. And we have an API, which the microservices talk to each other with. We use this custom thing called Serial, which uses uh, ZMQ. Uh, Twitter uses um, Thrift. And then it uses this thing called Finagle, which is a Scala uh, uh, RPC backend. But this doesn't even really matter. The Thrift and Finagle layer was a great place, I thought, to write tests. Mm -hmm. right, to start building something that looks like process replay. So Twitter had some stuff that looked kind of like this, but it wasn't offline. It was only online. So you could ship like a modified version of it, and then you could redirect some of the traffic to your modified version and diff those two, mm -hmm. but it was all online. Like, there was no like CI in the traditional sense. I mean, there was some, but like it was not full coverage. So you can't run all of Twitter offline to test something. Well, then this was another problem. You can't run all of Twitter, right? Period. Twitter Any runs, one person can't. Twitter run. runs in three data centers, and that's it. Yeah, there's no other place you can run Twitter, which is like, George, you don't understand. This is modern software development. No, this is bullshit. Like, why can't it run on my laptop? What do you do? Twitter can run it. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you're going to download the whole database to your laptop, but I'm saying all the middleware and the front end should run on my laptop, right? That sounds really compelling. Yeah, but can that be achieved at? by a code base that grows over the years. I mean, the three data centers didn't have to be, right? Because they're totally different like designs. The problem is more like, like why did the code base have to grow? What new functionality has been added to compensate for the, the lines of code that are there? One of the ways to explain it is that the incentive for software developers to move up in the company is to add code, yeah. to add and especially large. And you know what? The incentive for politicians to move up in the political structure is to add laws. Yeah. Same problem. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, the flip side is to simplify, simplify, simplify. I mean, you know what? This is something that I do differently from 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 Elon with with comma about self driving cars. You know, I hear the new version is going to come out, and the new version is not going to be better. But at first, and it's going to require a ton of refactors. I say, okay, take as long as you need. Like, you convince me this architecture is better? Okay, we have to move to it. Even if it's not going to make the product better tomorrow, the top priority is making is getting the architecture right. So what do you think about sort of a, a thing where the product is online? So how, I guess, would you do a refactor? If you ran engineering on Twitter, would you just do a refactor? How long would it take? What would that mean for the running of the, of the actual service? You know, and... I'm not the right person to run Twitter. I'm just not. And that's the problem. Like, like I don't really know. I don't really know if that's, you know, a common thing that I thought a lot while I was there was whenever I thought something that was different to what Elon thought. I'd have to run something in the back of my head reminding myself that Elon is the richest man in the world. And in general, his ideas are better than mine. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a few things I think I do understand and know more about. But like in general, I'm not qualified to run Twitter. I'm not, I shouldn't say qualified, but like, I don't think I'd be that good at it. I don't think I'd be good at it. I don't think I'd really be good at running an engineering organization at scale. I think I could lead a very good refactor of Twitter and it would take like six months to a year and the results to show at the end of it would be feature development in general it takes 10x less time, 10x less man hours. That's what I think I could actually do. Um, do I think that it's the right decision for the business? Above my pay grade. Yeah, but a lot of these kinds of decisions are above everybody's pay grade. I don't want to be a manager. I don't want to do that. I just like, like, if you really forced me to, yeah, it would make me maybe, make me upset if I had to make those decisions. I don't, I don't want to. Yeah, but a refactor is so compelling. If this is to become something much bigger than what Twitter was, is it feels like a refactor has to be coming at some point. George, you're a junior software engineer. Every junior software engineer wants to come in and refactor yeah. the whole code. Okay, <laughs> like that's like your opinion, man. Yeah, it um, doesn't, you know, sometimes they're right. <laughs> well, like whether they're right or not, it's definitely not for that reason, right? It's definitely not a question of engineering prowess. It is a question of maybe what the priorities are for the company. And I did get more intelligent like feedback from people I think in good faith, like mm -hmm. saying that. Um, from actually from Elon, 
and like you know from 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 Elon sort of like like people were like well you know a stop the world refactor might be great for engineering but you know we have a business to run and hey above my pay grade uh what do you think about Elon as an engineering leader having to experience him in the mo- most chaotic of spaces i would say my respect for him is unchanged um and i did have to think a lot more deeply about some of the decisions he's forced to make about the tensions within those the trade also within those decisions about like a whole like like matrix coming at him i think that's andrew tate's word for it sorry to borrow it also bigger than engineering yeah. just everything yeah like like the war on the woke yeah like it, it just it just man and like he doesn't have to do this you know he doesn't have to he could go like parag and go chill at the four seasons of maui you know but see one person i respect and one person i don't so his heart is in the right place fighting in this case for this ideal of the freedom of expression well, i wouldn't define the ideal so simply i think you can define the ideal no more than just saying Elon's idea of a good world. Yeah. Freedom of expression is but to you it's still the downsides of that is the monarchy. Yeah, I mean monarchy has problems, right? But I mean, would I trade right now the monarch the current oligarchy which runs America for the monarchy? Yeah, I would. Sure. For the Elon monarchy? Yeah, you know why? Because power would cost 1 cent a kilowatt hour. 10th of a cent a kilowatt hour. What do you mean? Right now, I pay about 20 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity in San Diego. That's like the same price you paid in 1980. What the hell? So you would see a lot of innovation yeah. with Elon. Maybe it'd have, maybe have some Hyperloops. Yeah. Right, and I'm willing to make that trade-off, right? I'm willing to make, and this is why, you know, people think that like dictators take power through some like, through some untoward mechanism. Sometimes they do, but usually it's because the people want them. And the downsides of a dictatorship, I feel like we've gotten to a point now with the oligarchy where, yeah, I would prefer the dictator.